Oh man, I forgot my uh, last bit of trivia. Oh man, that was uh, that Schwarzenegger and Stallone were the first people they had picked out for this movie. I mean, that's probably when like Sean would pitch it in like 1994, right yep. after he saw Twins. It was ag- <laughs> that's funny, but it's actually uh, John Woo nixed that idea when he came on. Oh, interesting. Yeah, he was like, no, we need Travolta and Cage. I don't know why specifically he wanted them, but <laughs> he's the one who was like, yeah, let's get rid of the, the, the beef dudes and go with these guys. Yeah, let's get rid of the beef dudes and get John Travolta. <laughs> yeah, here. the beefiest boy. Yeah, you're yeah. right. They're like, let's we'll average him out with a skeletal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he only had a per pound budget. Yeah, yeah. So like, oh, we can do Travolta, but we're going to have to slim down for part two. <laughs> You know, I might just use this whole thing as our intro. Boom, do it. Do it. All right. Here comes the theme. Hello and welcome to the Critical Breakdown, the podcast where we start at the bottom of Rotten Tomatoes and work our way to 100% fresh. I'm Caster Troy. No, I'm Max. And I'm Caster Troy. No, I'm Scott. But today we're talking Face Off, rated 92% on Rotten Tomatoes, and starring uh, multiple people embodying the, or inhabiting the body of Caster Troy, or I guess the face. Yeah. Well, the body Smooth, too. The bo- they, they did a whole rebuild there. Top to bottom. Yeah, yeah so this better, is... You better uh, put my scar back. Yeah, I don't need it, Scott. I don't need it. This is uh, our 92% film, as you said. And this and is your choice. Max. My choice. Yeah. I uh, I was just telling you right before we recorded, I figured you would either embrace this for the ridiculousness that it is or hate it or maybe both. Um, yeah. And uh, that's that's kind of seems... Know, let's, let's not... You know, I don't want anyone to know if I liked it or not. You know, let's wait until... Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's, let's get into get it to a it. little bit. But, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, so I was just going to say real quick, the reason I wanted to pick this one is because it's John Woo, it's Nicolas Cage, it's John Travolta, so it's like this powerhouse of like 90s ridiculousness. And yeah. uh, one thing I like about John Woo is, while I'm not always a fan of all of his work, I do like that he puts a lot in it. Like, they're, for what he's doing, it's very well crafted, and it's very over the top at the same time, which is like kind of hard to pull off sometimes. So I enjoy that, and then I also think uh, that this movie specifically is extremely influential on like every action movie that comes after it in some sense, like mainstream action movie, kind of like how Die Hard was for like a decade straight, like the most influential movie for action films. Um, yeah, for sure. You, you can see the, the fingerprints, the, the face off fingerprints in basically every modern action blockbuster. Yeah, for sure. Um, like, you know, it's funny while we were watching it and they came out around the same time, but I was thinking about The Rock, mm-hmm. which we also talked about just because they kind of have that same style of filmmaking, like, literally in terms of like the quality of the film and yeah, stuff yeah um but this is just so much better yeah and there's like if you're gonna sell a three-pack dvd set at a walmart with uh this movie in it you'd probably have con air and the rock like squished yeah. together um with that'd this one good, that'd be a good seller yeah you know, and, maybe that's a, a career path we can do after we get to 100 you know we can start putting those together for people yeah the five dollar bin dvds uh, uh, yeah, like like a multi-pack dvd curation <laughs> Write that down. I don't want to forget that. It's one. like Criterion, but like w- the bar is a lot lower. <laughs> Criterion. Yeah. But no, Ugh. so I just felt that most people are surprised when they hear this is a 92% film, but when you read the reviews, yeah. it makes a lot more sense as to where the reviews are. So before, you know, before we establish this film too much, I just wanted to say this is like, it's kind of film history, which is fun because it's a ridiculous picture at the same time. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, there's a lot going on though, so that's why it's a that's why it's a good watch. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of good watches, Scott, have you been watching anything good yourself? Ooh, 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 put me on the spot. Uh, I saw Ocean's Eight. Nice. Yeah, I heard it, that it it's. Was good. I heard I that it's it. fine to good somewhere in that range. Yeah, it was fine. Like, uh, you know, I I saw Ocean's Eleven like six months ago or something for the first time. I wasn't wasn't a big Danny Ocean guy. And, and you know what? Like, even watching it, I was like, I get why people like this, but I don't really care. Yeah. Um, so I just went and saw this because I heard it was fun, you know. Uh, I like a lot of the actresses involved. And, and I'm glad I went and saw it. Like, 
it's it's a little different than the Ocean's Eleven, like Ocean's Eleven, and then a bunch of the heist slash like crime movies that came after that. They kind of all did the same thing, where they would set up a master plan. There'd be narration walking you through the master plan. Then they'd execute it, and some things would go wrong and stuff yeah. like that. This is different though. This they just kind of they do a lot of the lead up, like oh, we need someone to do the cameras for this. Oh, we need you to be designing her dress. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But you don't know what the whole plan is, and then they go through it without narration or anything. So that like last third of the movie is just them executing this plan, and and it actually worked better for me because I didn't know what was going to happen and it was supposed to happen, and um, and that was fine for me. So I liked it though. It was good. It was funny. It wasn't like riotously laugh out loud funny, but it had little moments throughout that add up to an overall funny picture. Yeah. So, um. I mean, I've heard people are just like, they're just fine with it. Like, I don't know. I haven't heard anyone too crazy about it, but uh, I'm still interested yeah, in seeing it that. myself. It's uh, good. Anne Hathaway is amazing in the cool. movie. Like, yeah. she plays uh, the actress who is the Mark, and then more happens with that. But she's like, she's simultaneously like spacey and airheaded and vapid, but also like vulnerable and um, charming and all these characteristics that make the character work so well and she like really kills it and then like mindy kaling i really liked um kate blanchett i really liked i i'm not a big sandra guy but she did fine you know sandra yeah. bullock but her character honestly had the least like a uh, nuance it was like a pretty straight shooter and everybody else kind of had a little something else they brought to them you know aquafina pretty funny <laughs> you were worried about that yeah because who's aquafina you know i'm more of a dasani guy myself yeah. or you know what give me even a deer park wow no, I, I'm not even going to go that far, but Aquafina was uh, funny. Her character was good. So, no, it worked. It was, it was good. I liked it. That's cool, man. Uh, you should check it out, you know? Yeah, no, I, I'm down to. I just, uh, I, I have a busy week this time. I was hoping to, I was hoping to get yeah. in all the movies we talked about, but I might have to wait a week and see if I could squeeze this one in still. You might be able to get a good matinee going for that one, you know, like a Saturday matinee in a couple of weeks. A private theater you know just you and you, you and those eight lovely ladies yeah, you know that's I mean? true it sounds like a blast yeah so so you know it's a solid b for me solid b what about you you watched anything good this week oh uh, yeah i've been uh watching the documentary series uh the staircase on netflix yeah I, I i thought about throwing that on last night but uh i didn't it's so it's different than what you're expecting because the trailer makes it look like kind of crazy and when they hit well, like a certain line of the trailer you're like oh my god i gotta see this now but uh and it was an, it was a documentary series that came out in like the 90s or something right and early netflix, 2000s i want to say okay and then netflix bought it and it produced like three more episodes or something up yeah. in the case i think yeah it's uh it was from yeah. 2004 yeah. it like it's crazy because they start i guess filming it because it's like a novelist who people knew um, they started filming it at the exact time that the case starts. And uh, basically uh -huh. his wife dies by falling down a staircase and it's the, the police decided suspicious because there, there is some suspicious things with it. But uh, as it unravels, as it unravels more and more, you see him, you know, getting coached by his uh, lawyers, how to handle things um, there's some secrets about his uh, just his personal life that come out that are interesting, some things from his past. And it's interesting to see it from the like a live, not live, obviously, but to see it from the time period it's happening from the uh, just the perspectives there. And also it's like early, you know, earlier in our time period, it's over 10 years ago. So some opinions on things have changed and that kind of reflects in there, too. Um, it's interesting. It's a really interesting documentary, but it's not. It's if you're expecting it to be like making a murderer or um, the Robert Durst one, it's a lot different than that. So it's a little bit the jinx, the jinx. Is the jinx. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you're expecting that level okay. of like, oh my god, like right away, it, it definitely is like a slower, like more procedural thing. Um, but it's it's super interesting still. It's just okay. not like that dynamite like those two were. This one's more, you know, let's let's go through the process. And right now I'm at the period where it's still the court case is actually happening. So I haven't got to the updated stuff uh, okay. yet, so I don't know if it changes once it hits the updated stuff. Interesting, interesting. It didn't. It hasn't gotten like the same uh, press that Making a Murder and stuff did. So yeah. I, I don't imagine like that makes me think there's not like that groundbreaking anything happening towards the end because if there was, obviously it would be more of a story. But yeah, that's true. Um, but I, I probably will check it out. I love those. Uh, 
I love a good crime doc docu series. You know, I'm very yeah, into and this one's uh, very a lot more like procedural in some ways. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, that is cool. If you enjoy those procedures. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been I've been uh, still going through season two of Riverdale. It's very good. It's very still working good. on that one. Yeah, it's it's a full twenty two episodes. I thought it was going to be a lot shorter, um, but this one's a this one's a full boy. Because the first season, I think, was only like 11 or 13 episodes. But yeah. this one, it's interesting, like at the mid-season point, there is like the biggest plot that was happening wraps up and now a new plot starts. And um, so that's where I am now. I'm getting to the new plot, you know. It, it's very strange. It's very strange. Uh, uh, one of the characters becomes a, uh, a cam girl. <laughs> uh, another one of the characters becomes an FBI informant. Uh, another one of the characters starts running an illicit business. Um, it's just really, you know, and all of those characters are supposed to be like 15 or 16. Yeah. So um, it's good. It's really good. Uh, someone cut someone's arm off. Well, that's um, excessive. Yeah, there's, there's a lot going on. And, and, you know, it's all just very sensible. That's what I like about it. So, so. I mean. Literally, if those sentences didn't get you interested on it on their own, then you're not going to want to watch Riverdale. I was, I was about to say, I don't know why my wife doesn't watch this show. Yeah, it's it's right up her alley. Yeah. It oh, is, for sure. It is beautiful high schoolers doing things that adults should never do. Yeah, it's like pure garbo, but like in a good okay. way, it sounds like. Yeah, 100%. So, well, uh, just... there, there, was some, there were some Indian burial grounds in the last episode. Oh, shit. Uh, so yeah, it's getting really interesting. I'm for oh, sure. and one of the characters' mothers is a prostitute now. Okay. Um. So that was good too. My mom's got to make a living. Hey, mom's spaghetti. You know what I mean. <laughs> Everyone can have a have a have a have a pe mm. have a piece. Mm. No. Well, yeah. Let's move on from that. Well, what about any? What's the what's the new trailer that's really caught your eye, Max? New I mean, Dumbo, trailer. right? Dumbo actually was a pretty good trailer, actually, man. Yeah, it was a pretty good trailer, and I didn't like that because it's Tim Burton, and I'm not. But it's I'm usually not all that into Tim Burton, but it looked a little like Big Fish. I was gonna say uh, he called up Danny DeVito, who grabbed his top hat. That's always a good sign. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nah, man. I mean, it looked pretty good. I can't lie. I got a little bit of chills at the end there, which was impressive. Oh, was it when Dumbo flap, 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 and flew away? Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. No matter how yeah, small they are. Colin Farrell gets in there. It's like, no matter how small, we all care for you. And so Dumbo knocks all the hay away. Yeah. yeah it's. Did you uh, it's, did you watch the trailer for The Nun? The, no, I didn't. That's of the Conjuring cinematic universe, correct? I believe so. They, I believe it is, and that's why I did not watch it. Yeah. I have watched an entire Conjuring film. That's right. And I still deserve credit for that. I will tell you even though I'm about to describe one part to you, you should watch the first three seconds of the trailer, then shut it off <laughs> because it opens. And this is almost like an indictment in our society in a way, but also like extremely funny at the same time to me. It opens with the words in big, bold letters, make sure you watch to the end. Uh, and I did. And it's just like a jump scare at the end. And well, then there's, is that? <sighs> there's a Wait. couple seconds later that happens like after the jump scare. And then it's just like, I was like, oh, well, what comes after it? Like nothing. Is Was that like the whole YouTube um, five second ad version where it's like, you know, they'll put like the coming up, the Mission Impossible trailer and they'll show one stunt in that five seconds when you can't it's, skip it. It's was a it new, something like that? It's a new approach to it, I think, because the trailer is only like 90 seconds long and uh, it's pretty standard, right? Yeah. 90 seconds uh, for like a teaser type of trailer. Yeah. 90 seconds is, is fine. Usually that's like 90 seconds to two, two and a half minutes is kind of the, the range of like good trailers at yeah. least. But, uh, I um, believe the fate of the furious trailer was like three and a half minutes. Yeah, maybe if I'm remembering like correctly. four minutes, <laughs> three hours. Uh, and I still kind of want to watch it because <laughs> of that. I'm, I'm going to beat you like a Cherokee drum line, <laughs> but no, uh, I think the new approach here is instead of showing the couple scenes of like spoilers before the trailer, they were like daring you, like make sure you watch to the end. I, I actually think that might work, you know? No, I think, I mean, I watched all the way to the end and I have no oh. interest in that series really as a whole. Like I'm fine with it, but like Jody wouldn't look at the screen cause the nun really scared her. So that's why I'm telling you like only watch the first couple seconds, but it's funny. Yeah. 
So um, you, you watch the first couple seconds for a teaser that says to watch to the end. And then don't watch to the end. <laughs> um, All right, fair enough. Fair yeah, enough, yeah. man. Uh, I am actually really excited about the Halloween trailer. I thought it looked yeah, really it looked good. pretty good. Um, I've never seen any of the other Halloween movies, but um, that's fine. Yeah. Very true. Maybe, maybe this year for our Halloween special with Kara, we can all go see <laughs> Halloween together. That would be cool. Yeah. We'll see, though, because I recently saw a scary movie, and that might be yeah, that might enough for the year. Clear and I don't want to blow all. my scary movie load um, before it chapter two comes out or whatever they're going to call it. Yeah. That makes sense. So, yeah. Um, I liked the trailer for the old man and the gun. That was pretty good. Yeah. The, the Robbie Redford, uh, Casey Affleck, uh, David Lowry flick. Yeah. So I'm, I'm into it. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other, uh, the bad times at El Royale trailer did look good. Yeah, it did look interesting. Um, Oh, you know what's funny? Hotel Artemis came out. Yeah, that is funny. Man, that's funny because I saw a million ads for it because I have YouTube TV, mm-hmm. and, you know, not sponsoring the episode, but everybody go buy YouTube TV, use our affiliate code, TCB, whatever. Um, <laughs> and every advertisement in any of the on-demand stuff on YouTube TV for like three weeks was just Hotel Artemis. Or Is that even the name of it? I'm not even yeah, sure. Yeah, that is. Okay. It's a hospital, um, but they call it Hotel Artemis. It's yeah, very confusing. Yeah. Um, and then it just, it came out, it bombed. I, it's reviews were like middling, but nobody saw it. Yeah. And I didn't even realize it had already come out. So. Yeah. I knew it was coming out, but then I was like, oh, it actually, like, I didn't know it actually came out. So <laughs> maybe they confusing. should have, uh, in the first couple seconds of the movie said, make sure you watch till the end. Yeah. And then more people would have, well, I'm sure once you buy the ticket, they actually don't care if you watch till the end. Yeah, that's true. You know? Interesting. But we'll ask some of our producer friends yeah. if they care if you actually watch a movie. Uh, the, the good ones do. We'll the say good producers that. or the good movies? Both. Um, movies can't really care, but you know the producers can. So. Yeah, yeah that's the thing. That's the thing. Yeah. Well, you know what I, you know what I, you know what I care about, Max. What's that? I care about people's faces. And getting them off. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that. You're like, I see what you did there, and I don't appreciate it. Oh. Well, anyways, uh, what is the plot synopsis for, uh, you know, Face Off? For Face Off. Counterterrorism agent Sean Archer must literally wear his arch enemy Caster Troy's face in order to stop an upcoming terrorist threat. But the plan goes haywire when Troy takes Archer's face for his own. Oh, man. I love a, a plot synopsis that has a twist in it. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's the only, you know it's gonna be a good that's the only way to really sell this one, you know? Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise you're like, okay, they sw- why they swap faces? Yeah. Like yeah. immediately yesterday uh, when, when we were watching it, Jody was like, why would, why would he swap faces with a criminal? Like before the, like five minutes of the movie, she's like, why is, she, why is he going to swap faces with this guy? And I was like, watch it. <laughs> You know what's funny though is I also was wondering, uh, wondering why. Like even as I started, I knew eventually they'd get there, but I was like, okay, why are they gonna swap faces? I yeah. thought when when Nicolas Cage fell into that like uh, like particle beam or whatever that was <laughs> that killed him yeah. or knocked him in a coma, I thought that that was gonna somehow knock his face off, or Travolta would go in after him, and then what? Like his buddy would accidentally hit the button that would like melt their faces together and. Then when that didn't go, come through, I was like, okay, well, how are they going to get there? And then they just do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I like that it's not like an oops thing, that it's like intentional. Yeah. I feel like it's uh, it just works better. The oops thing could have worked in a different movie. Yeah. Like, if that was happening and then the, the whole mo- thing was about, like, the criminal um, suddenly having a new lease on life or something. I don't know. Um, yeah. It's a way different movie so far. Yeah, yeah. it's a, kind of a rom com, actually. But at the same head. time, uh, I mean, there are some elements of it in here, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. like uh, sure. you do see some growth from both characters, which is kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> in different ways, like they ha- both have personal growth, and then they still have their big showdown at the end. And you know, it's it's a fight to the death, basically. But uh, 
um, it, it is funny that they stopped and, and had those moments in here where uh, just, you know, bef- before we get into too much plot, um, Caster Troy, when he is in Sean Archer's body, keeps like perving on uh, Archer's daughter, who is sure. very much like 16 um, or younger. But uh, yeah, yeah. And then when he sees uh, <laughs> kind of telling now, uh, knowing that this guy apparently has uh, some stories against him out there, but uh Danny Masterson or whatever from that 70s show Hyde. Yeah. When yep. Hyde's like uh, all on her. He He's like, getting his rape on. Yeah, you know? he, he kicks he kicks his ass and chases him off and then Well, I, I don't want to gloss over this because before the movie started I asked if you wanted to know what my favorite part was. Mm, okay. And that was actually my favorite part of the movie because We've seen that scene before, you know, where like the guy's making a move on the girl in the car. Yeah. You know, uh, Back to the Future is a good example. Yeah. The guy opens the door, pulls the guy out, you know, uh, beats on him, does whatever. But this movie does it differently, and it's like the perfect encapsulation of Face Off. Instead of opening the door, John Travolta, possessed by <laughs> Caster Troy, or I guess it was him, Sean Archer. Was that the character's name? Yeah. Yeah. Sean Archer, possessed by the villain, Caster Troy, instead kicks the driver side window in <laughs> and then pulls him out that way. And I just love that because they made it look like he was just going to open the door and then they cut back to Danny Masterson yeah. and then boom, cut, jump, uh, kick through the window. I just I really love that that's what the movie chose to do. Yeah, it. I mean, it leans in <laughs> on these moments and I think it pays off for the film. Um, it's yeah, everything like, else about the scene is very conventional. It's yeah. just... The fact that they went for that insane way to do it at the start. Like you can open a door or you can kick open a door, basically. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I, I really loved that. Yeah. No, it's 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 funny. And that scene shows him going from like scumbag that we've seen because he's been a scumbag the entire time. Yeah. They made sure you knew because within the first 45 seconds, uh, Nicolas Cage does like three really creepy things. He licks his mustache a couple times. Yeah. He drinks from a straw, which is there's nothing <laughs> creepy about that, but it was just weird how often they showed it. And then he kills a kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that, and that I love then later in the movie when they're they're talking about it, and he's like, "Oh, like I didn't mean to kill that kid." And then it looked like he shot another kid. He he didn't end up shooting another kid, but he didn't I, seem to have a big problem with it. No, not at all. Um, I love that. Uh, it opens with that like dreamlike sequence of a kid getting shot. Yeah. It really does set the tone for like the whole film because I mean, you know, something bad's about to happen, but it's shot like, like any TV show would do like, like save by the doll's dream sequence. Basically. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so like standard dream sequence filter. You could make that on Instagram basically, but, uh, it's it's ridiculous and i love it and like you said he has this weird mustache and it just it's slow motion um yeah it is. there's like that, that's there's like a john woo thing right the slow motion yeah oh yeah and there's yeah. that uh it's like a music box is going the whole time for some reason yeah. dude i mean it's so weird dude, the, the music in this movie was so weird yeah there's uh, one scene where there's like a massive shootout at a drug like cartel kind of mm-hmm. Um, and there's a kid there, and so now you have Archer in Castro Troy's body. He finds out Castro Troy's the father, and so he's like very nurturing towards his kid, though he shouts his son's name at him at one point, which was very funny. He was like, Michael! <laughs> uh, but then after the shootout starts, he puts his headphones on. He's like, listen to your music. And the kid was listening to like a very weird, like slow, jazzy, seductive version of Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Yeah. Which, like, why would a kid be listening to that? Yeah, so and then the whole shootout was done to that song, which it was funny. But the whole time I couldn't get out of my head, like, why was this child listening to this? Like, so, listen to your music. <laughs> want to know one of my favorite things about that sequence? I, I want to know all of your favorite things about that sequence. So, well, there's a lot, honestly, in that one. It was completely ridiculous. Um, <laughs> starting from the top, the drug sequence was amazing. Uh, when he does whatever drug he does in his drink. Uh, yeah. And Nicholas Cage is there like having a freak out in the best way, like a, like a fish out of water drug, drugged up freak out. Um, just, just some top, top performance there from Cage. I uh, really appreciated way, it. Before, before we move on, drugged up freak out. I don't want that as my band name. <laughs> That's a good band name actually. Um, and then I really liked that Dietrich Hassler, the bald guy he's hanging out with is yeah. uh, Nick Cassavetes. Yeah. Who you might know as uh, the director of John Q and the oh, note man. and the notebook. 
Wow, I did not know that. Yeah, I, I didn't put I didn't put it all together. So uh, that character is just like a complete screwball for some reason. He's real funny and weird. Uh, He's uh, he Gina Gershon plays like uh, Pastor Troy's like baby mama, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And he's her brother. And then after he gets shot in the neck, Mm -hmm. he has like he somehow has the wherewithal to still like full on kiss her on the mouth. Yeah. And then he just like dies and spews blood like a fruit punch fountain. It was like a little lingering there for brother sister. I think maybe Nick Cazavetes was just like, I want to kiss Gina Gershon, so I'm going to yeah. do it. He, he didn't realize it was his last day on set. <laughs> yeah. so. He's like, shit. Um, yeah. But no, so I thought since he was an alum with John Q, it's worth oh, mentioning. Oh, for sure. He's in the Pantheon now in, the, in one of the more unique ways. Yeah, yeah. that's true. One of prob- Yeah, that might be the only person who's like that. Oh, well, now I have to do the research. I got to go to the vault. Let's, let's, let's do it later. Rob <laughs> Reiner, has he been in? He might have been in Bobby. <laughs> Ooh. Actually, uh, who directed Bobby? Uh, was it Ralph Reiner? I, I don't remember. It was Estevez, wasn't it? Yeah, or, yeah, or, it was Emilio Estevez. Yeah, so that kind yeah. now that's still. Mm. That, I mean, that there's not really much of a tie there, but. Well, I was trying to think. I, I I get it. Yeah, <laughs> there's there's sheens in our movies and stuff, but uh, it was yeah. worth a shot. Like you said, this movie begins basically with us finding out right away that you know Nick Cage is a bad guy. He's he's Castro yeah. Troy. Um. And then we get treated to this kind of amazing uh, airport chase where they're oh playing God. chicken with like a Hummer versus an airplane. But yeah, uh, like you already know that Travolta's character like kind of wants to die. Yeah, definitely has a death wish because, um, you know, you know, his son died in front of him in his arms um, for a bolt that was meant for him. Um, and th- the character introductions of this movie are pretty on point. They're, they're pretty solid. Uh with like you mentioned uh you know first you see caster troy licking his lips and drinking out of a straw and shooting a kid and then next up he's uh dressed as a priest uh like messing with a choir and harassing some young woman um yeah smoking a cigarette he armed a bomb and they were singing handles messiah i wrote all of that down because the scene is (laughs) is is kind of the aesthetic yeah that i want for my life in the future it's funny because you think if you're going to do a terrorist attack and you, you're you going to set up a bomb, you want to blend in. Yeah, he does not. Castro Troy takes the exact opposite approach to that. And that's kind of, I think, what sets him above a lot of criminals in movies. Um, yeah, for sure. You know, he's kind of Joker-esque in this film um, yeah. in many ways. And I, I really enjoy the performance as a whole. But what I really think is cool is uh, just doing my research on the film, uh, both him and Travolta, this is kind of the height of their maybe not the height of their careers as a whole, but like this is right when cage transitioned from like weird indie movies to doing uh, like action films yeah. and uh, Travolta this is what leads to your gone in 60 seconds. Yeah. And Travolta had had his Pulp Fiction revival by now and had done already. Uh, he did broken arrow with uh, John Woo already by this point, I think. Um, and he had already, yes, you know, yeah. reestablished that he can carry a, a film, you know, after Pulp Fiction, it was like, yeah, this guy's back. Um, so they were both, you know, at career heights for themselves uh, at this point. And so they took it very serious, which I think pays off in the film because uh, they developed quirks like character profiles for both characters so they could tap into it, which is really cool. Um, If you're going to do this movie, that's the way to do it. You know, get two guys who are really embracing the role. They're probably, you know, if if there was an Olympics for overacting, you would want these two guys to compete for it. Um, (laughs) Just in general, they're always that way. But, uh, you know they they can they can do good performances both because I've seen them both do good performances but when they when they ramp it up man they go crazy so with Castro Troy uh, we see him meet up with his brother in an airplane and then get on this like private plane and that's where the the first face off happens but uh I mean his when he meets that woman he's just like come here suck on my tongue it's yeah when he meets the stewards I think I yeah. might have written down some of his lines there yeah what the first thing he said to her is he told her to come sit on, on his lap which she did and then he said to her you know I could eat a peach for hours yeah. I quote and... that all the time not in pervy <laughs> situations just in other situations and nobody gets it I'm glad he, you'll finally get it he, he says he, he talks about eating peaches a lot yeah uh, and then he tells her like something about like sucking on his tongue. He sticks his tongue out and then she starts sucking on his tongue. Yeah. And then you find out, you know, she's a federal agent. 
Uh, she gets thrown out of the airplane in a pretty violent way, which was yeah. actually kind of funny to me. <laughs> but uh, th- yeah, so then you had the weird game of chicken. And then he was like, he had a gun to the pilot's head. Mm-hmm. And he was like, uh, get this plane off the ground. And he was like, oh, we don't have enough speed. And then they push it up to high speed. And then one of their engines goes out and the pilot's like, oh, uh, the engine's gone. We need to stop. And he just shoots him. Yeah, that was a bad he, idea. That was a horrible idea. Because then it just crashes into like a storage unit. Then he drives it, yeah, into, like, the hangar that's used to store, like, the... Experimental laser yeah. engines or something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you had a... I mean, it wasn't, like, a very interesting shootout or anything here, but you had a good, sh- like, cat and mouse game that, that ended with the death of Caster Troy, seemingly. Yeah. Um, I like... What I liked about it in this scene was uh, they really went out of their way to establish that these men are good at their job in a sense where they're tracking bullets and most yeah. action films are known for having you know like like a bukkake of bullets in every single scene um and this one seems like it's doing that and then all of a sudden he's like huh, well you have one bullet left and you know uh, archer's like you do too yeah and, but caster Troy or uh, archer was wrong yeah yeah so i mean it, it's just a funny scene that they they play on this trope of uh, of action films with that and then it you know he's wrong (laughs) but uh but it's i like that they do that that they take the time to establish like this this concept within the world um that bullets do matter even though i think in most action scenes in this film there's probably 400 bullets like in each scene so they don't really matter but they know that they're a thing exactly and it kind of it's just it's just a funny shout out to how action movies operate and i appreciate that that's in here like it's it's goofy but it's 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 good um one of the things that frustrated me is like at almost literally every turn, both of these guys are ace shots and credible at their job until they're shooting at the other guy. Yeah. Which, I mean, that's plot armor. That's pretty standard. Yeah, it but does. Yeah. These guys like uh, Travolta's hanging out of a um, out of a helicopter that he sort of hijacks, hangs out while flying a helicopter and shoots the engine out of an airplane like in one shot. <laughs> Uh, then these guys are on either side of a mirror later in the movie and they both like unload full rounds and yeah. can't hit the other. And it's just like, there's always something that takes me out of it with that. Like, I don't even care if the main guy isn't shown nailing every shot, you know? Yeah. But, uh, just, I just like a consistency, you know? Well, and like, that's kind of where, even though, you know, I, I said earlier that, um, Die Hard kind of set like a, a standard for a lot of action movies. The only, real action movie that really nailed the uh he's not always the best person like for the job was the original Die Hard movie you know um yeah. like when he's walking on glass and shit like that like they really made him a guy who was just barely hanging on to the to the struggle there but uh f- nobody hanging else on to the struggle. that that's like i think besides maybe uh Air Force 1 is like the only other movie i could think where it's like kind of a guy you know in over his head but it's the president and uh he's still you know in the end he wins but um but no it's it's funny because that's true like these guys are ace you know crack shots uh at, until they point guns at each other sure. <laughs> maybe like you could sort of justify it because the they wouldn't want to hit each other's heads or faces because they want to yeah once they swap for sure each other's uh, faces pristine so maybe that affected the way that they were shooting i wish there would have been a line like that where they would one would say to the other like like oh let's go kill him just don't shoot him in the face uh, you know yeah something dumb like that but they never go on the nose it's like the only thing they don't do on the nose in the movie yeah what I do mean, you th- I don't think I don't think we have to go scene by scene no no um, I was the prison say, scene uh, was very interesting though which one the prison scene yes um, uh, after after the face uh, transplant to get the comatose caster Troy's face onto John Travolta's body um they they do that because they need to find out where this bomb is um that uh caster troy's brother has planted designed hidden um Mm -hmm. and they put it somewhere before that uh airplane chase um so there was a lot of interesting stuff about the prison one was john carroll lynch as the main guard yeah that was good to see him uh two was the the uh magnetic boots Uh uh-huh I want to know where the idea even came from because that's not, there's nothing like that anywhere. Uh, right? I actually no that that's not real. Um, yeah, I do have an explanation for the magnetic boots and that whole prison as a whole. Uh, 
This movie was originally written as a science fiction film completely. And uh, John Woo said he would make the movie, but he didn't want it to be set in the future. He wanted it to be set like current okay. time, but he loved the idea of like this weird uh, oil drilling prison. Um, so he kept it. He kept that sequence in there, just how okay. it was. That's, that's interesting. Um, I, I get that then um, yeah. because it does seem like an alien. Like what was the, isn't there a movie where like the cell or something where they're like on a space colony prison? Uh, no, there is the cell and it does deal with like prison, but um, you're thinking of. That might be a Stallone movie though I'm thinking of. You're, you're getting, I, I think you might be thinking about Lockout with Guy Pierce. Which is the that, space prison movie? Uh, I definitely haven't seen it. So you might I also be thinking you. mixing it with Demolition Man, which is where St- Sylvester Stallone goes to the future, and there is a prison in it. Yeah. And then uh, there was another one I was thinking that you might have been considering, and I could easily see where all these get confused. Uh, I'm circling the drain here, but yeah. eventually I'd get there. Yeah. But They're all the same like aesthetic, basically. Yeah. So. Yeah, there's a space prison sort of in uh, Battlefield Earth too. That's true. Except in that one, they all just eat green slop. In this one, they have magnetic shoes that are only sort of magnetic. They're, like, always magnetic to the sense that nobody can walk around comfortably. Yeah. But they're also not that magnetic because they still kick each other in the head. But then they're super magnetic when they want them to be. That's true. But we did have the lovely Thomas Jane in here in a very small role. God, I was dying laughing. I assumed that he was going to be a much bigger character. Yeah. Because you you watched it uh, the night before I did, I think, or two nights, and you texted me said Thomas Jane is in this, and so then I saw him and I was like, okay, he he's probably that that's how he's gonna get out of prison or something like that. Yeah. And then, nope, he's in like two scenes and he has goofy hair. Yeah, he has like long curly blonde hair. Yeah, which was which was fun. All of that was fun. Oh, for sure. Um, and then like it was actually a pretty classic prison breakout where like they did the same thing in Solo actually where there's like the fake fight or it wasn't even a fake fight, but a fight led to the guards interacting. And then the two people who fought each other worked together to escape like at a high level. Yeah. The yeah. same thing happened on in uh, Han and Chewie and solo. Hey, so. there's, a, there's another similarity with this uh, movie and solo. Oh, what's that? Uh, same composer. Oh, nice. Yeah. John Williams. We- uh, John Powell, actually. Uh, <laughs> he worked with John Williams to do Solo. Oh, uh, okay. Um, I think uh, they took, obviously, Williams, like, uh, actual yeah, like, Han Solo yeah. musics and uh, worked with so, him on it. Yeah. Uh, I did not think the music here was remarkable. The script is also pretty awful, uh, but, like, it sort of suits the over-the-top nature of the film. Yeah. yeah. Uh, There's a couple one of, things. One of my favorite lines, bef- right before the prison... Mm-hmm. where um, they're interrogating some of Castor Troy's men to try and figure out where this bomb is. And he's interrogating maybe like the second command or something. And the guy's like, oh, I'm not going to talk, blah, 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 you know. And then he says, uh, hey, Sean, how's your dead son? <laughs> he laughs like really big like that. And it's just so stupid. Yeah, yeah. It was really How's dumb. your dead son? Even a villain wouldn't say something like that. They would at least come up with a quip. You know, like, how's your dead son is even funny. The Yeah, so some of the some of the writing, like, as far as dialogue, is pretty goofy. Like, we've already quoted some of the, the parts there. But what I find yeah. interesting, because it's it's played really strongly in here, and uh, obviously that's from direction and acting, uh, but the, the core of it comes from the writing of the story, which is that, uh, you know, Sean Archer begins the film as a broken man and slowly, like, rebuilds himself in a healthy way, like, masculinity-wise. Um so he's ever compensating for this like huge emotional issue he has, which is not getting over the death of his son, which is understandable. But yeah. uh, but it's almost like there's this huge, ridiculous emotional undertone to the film that you don't expect because you think John Woo action movie, you think the doves, you think the guns, the slow motion like jackets blowing in the wind that are amazing. Um, you, you get all of that. You too. get all of it. And then on top of that, you get this weird like statement on, you know, men being able to open up and let go. And it's tied together with him and Castor Troy going through their own like development paths here. Um, like, you know, Castor Troy is basically just trying to bone his wife out of like spite and vengeance. But obviously he ends up like for a brief moment kind of fixing their relationship in a weird way. Uh, you know, yeah. teaches the daughter about self-defense and kind of realizes he can't, you know, perv on this girl anymore um, 
while still being like cool to her by offering her cigarettes and shit and telling her you should end a butterfly knife yeah and tell but he also told her like all this makeup all all this like appearance you should just be yourself like you know i know that you're sad about your brother but you should just be yourself um which is a weird and and it was an interesting line because earlier in the movie when uh travolta's sean archer Mm -hmm. was talking to her about it he was like what are you trying to do with all this makeup and she said i'm trying to be myself yeah and then again later he's like you should actually be yourself yeah Um, that actually works pretty well yeah and uh i mean that kind of storytelling there is like you don't expect it in this type of movie so it's it's interesting and god i wouldn't want to change this movie at all i'm I'm fine with how it is because it's just like a it's like a roller coaster ride of, of fun um but (laughs) <laughs> it, it is interesting that there's this huge like emotional story underneath the surface that you don't expect in like the modern action movie. And I, I think that comes a lot from it being John Woo on top of everything, who, sure. you know, is an Asian filmmaker like from from that market. And he, he came to America. This was like his big run in America where he made a bunch of films. But, uh, you know, a lot more of their movies. I mean, like we watched uh, The Departed a couple of weeks ago and, you know, that's a crime story, but it has a lot of emotional undertones to it. Um, and right. the originals did, too. So it's just like a lot of these directors that were coming over um, and their works were coming over and, and their action movies are very emotional, very melodramatic at the same time. And I think John Woo brings that in a way that's super cool that, you know, we watched The Rock and it didn't have this level of emotion to it at all. No, no, not at all. <laughs> so it's funny not that this movie is ridiculous where like when he first meets the daughter, he refers to her as a peach. Um, after him saying the creepy peach line earlier, you're like, yeah. oh, gross. Uh, that's terrible. But then by the end of it, you're like, wow, he's actually like kind of teaching her about herself. Um, yeah, and, that, that was an interesting turn for the. Yeah. For so the it's character. just it's super. I, I love this movie and I think it's a great movie, but it's also an absurd movie. And that's the only way I can really handle it where I do like it a lot, yeah. but it's completely absurd. It's definitely absurd and it's over the top and it's bombastic. Yeah. And where John Woo really shines is in these like ridiculous action sequences like they never turn the dial down during mm-hmm. the action sequences. They're all at ten the whole time, yeah. or maybe even eleven. You know, uh, including the end chase has just or the end action scene has just about everything you'd ever want. Yeah, it has sh- shootouts. It has a boat chase. It has hand to say, hand combat. It starts and it ends with John Travolta cutting his own face <laughs> yeah. off. It starts in a church, yeah. moves from there to like like you said a boat chase to yeah. a fist fight with a yeah a knife to the face like it's amazing yeah. um that not just a knife to the face a knife to his own face yeah yeah that's true and a harpoon gun through the chest um yeah like it's awesome in that yeah. sense where it's just like you don't necessarily think they're going to go that full path in a, in a movie and in this one you can you can just rest assured that it's going to happen yeah and it's not always a good thing like <laughs> Uh, think of the born. No, no, no. In this movie, I'm saying it works, but yeah. just to to take that path after the born uh, trilogy, especially, I think movies that came out like this still tried to ground themselves in realism. And so, like, look at like the remake of like the taking of Pelham one two three and yeah. all that. Like those movies should be these crazy over the top mm-hmm. action movies that still got lost trying to be gritty and dark. Like look at um, like Quantum of Solace versus. Uh, Skyfall or yeah. versus Casino Royale even. In Casino Royale, there's a scene where uh, Bond is playing poker, dying, <laughs> goes to a car, resuscitates himself, and then comes back and finishes the hand he was yeah. in. Yeah. Like, then Quantum of Solace comes around and, and they couldn't do anything like that. They're fighting over, like, water in the Middle East. And it's like, yeah. okay. Yeah, you're taking the realistic path, which obviously it works. Look at the Bourne movies and stuff. But there's room for a movie like this as long as... Like we talk a lot about like making a movie like with a certain level of sincerity and yeah. like genuineness to it. And this has it. Yeah. Like it had an $80 million budget, which now that doesn't even sound that crazy, but that's a high budget for a for movie sure. that came out in what was this? 2001? No, 1997. 1997. Yeah. Even more so, man. And had, uh, had you not had Titanic and a couple other big hitters, this might've made the top 10 for the year, like grossing yeah. wise. Cause it did really um, well. I think it did like 250 or something, right? Worldwide, it did about that domestic, which is the number we always okay. uh, like to trot out there. It did 112, which is nothing to shake a stick at, you know. So it definitely made its budget back. It opened at 23 million, June 27th, 1997, heart of the summer. You know, we're coming mm-hmm. up on the one year anniversary. Wow, or not one year? God, <laughs> we're coming up on the anniversary of its yeah, release. Yeah, 21 year. Uh, yeah, 21 year. Ah, oh, can drink now. 
Um, and it opened number one ahead of the second week of the Cartoon Hercules mm-hmm. and the or excuse me, the third week of the Cartoon Hercules and the second week of Batman and Robin. Yeah, so, yeah. A fun week. Con Air was also in theaters at the same time. It was much further down the um, down the list. I think it had come out like five weeks before this or something else. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah. No, that is interesting. Um, I, yeah. Con Air, I haven't seen it in so long. I do remember some parts, like liking some parts in it, but he has this weird like Forrest Gump accent the whole time. <laughs> we we thought about watching it. I, I forget what line it's on, um, but and, and I don't remember what we picked over it, but I remember it was one of our like leading nominees um, on whatever. I want to say Con Air is like in the 50s, maybe? Yeah, it's in the 50s. Let's see, 1997, 55. So I don't know what we watched. It said Mamma Mia, maybe. Uh, maybe Dune. Dune, yeah, maybe Dune. Dune's good. <laughs> well, it's good to talk about. Do you have any like favorite standout parts or anything from um, from Face Off here? Like, um, I talked about a couple of my individual favorite lines and scenes, but yeah, there's uh, I mean, I'm trying to think of individual like unique parts that really stood out to me. Uh. In in there. general, I really like the uh, like kind of fight choreography in the um, like I said the uh, the scene where they the raid uh, where the raid happens on the the friends' houses. Um, yeah, like the middle action scene. Yeah. Like uh, I like how bloody it was and violent. Um, it was a little over the top, but of course it was. But I did like uh, yeah, I did like the silent shots of what was the of Adam standing on like the glass thing with the FBI just shooting everywhere. And he's like, obviously yeah. about to get killed and, and the light coming up from um, yeah. bottom. <laughs> and then I like that. It was like literally 30 to 45 seconds after he was, uh, after Nicholas cage got to yell at Michael in the creepiest way ever. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I like, I like all that. Uh, I did like that when Archer explained how he got the face, that they didn't ever show it beyond him, like in the reflection, like demanding he gets not Archer. Uh, when Castro Troy gets the Archer face, but uh, yeah, he demands he gets it. They show the reflection, then it cuts to the prison when they're like, uh, Troy, somebody wants to meet with you, and he believes it's going to be like you know his freedom finally. Yeah, because and he had just found out when where the bomb was, yeah. so he was like, "Wait, did they ever?" Yeah, they did defuse the bomb. Okay, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I was just that's on my list of things I, I do love about this movie. But uh, but yeah, so I like the reveal when uh when Troy walks in with Archer's face and just like you know just fucks with him yeah. right there. Um, it's yeah. brilliant. It that part's like. Wh- I was like on the edge of my seat, and I've seen this movie before, so I was like, "Oh my god!" Like. <laughs> This ridiculous, but uh, it was pretty cool because I thought he was gonna get let out as well. There, yeah. but and then I like that uh, that when he explains what's going on, yeah, he explains it, but they show it at the same time because he's like giving hints about it, like that yeah. place burned up, and he shows like a newspaper or something. But then it yeah. cuts to like all of his uh, people he worked with on this this thing getting burned like tito and he cries tito afterwards um <laughs> it's just i enjoy that aspect of the filmmaking here like it was really cool um and yeah, then no, a well, lot- it was a good way to to show that without it being like yeah a dry flashback exactly and then you also play with the time a little bit there you know jumping back to show it so that the audience is literally shocked even though you know it's the premise of the film um yeah but then uh just in general with the fight choreography i enjoy that you know even though filmmakers like um like matthew vaughn were already making movies by this point you can tell that like john woo's style definitely influenced them as filmmakers as they went into bigger action movies and stuff um no doubt you know a young director you watch a john oh, yeah. woo movie you, you take something away yeah and uh i mean just the way the gunfights are filmed in this makes me think of and i haven't seen either movie so i can't really talk about the film sure. writing or plot but makes me think of the trailers for like the kingsman movies when i see those when you see like uh, Pedro Pascal yeah. like flipping around like a whip with like a gun and stuff like that like I'm just like that's that's beautiful in a way that like John Woo does that kind of stuff and it, it just carried on to other filmmakers so the the Kingsman movies are a lot more action comedy this is yeah. more just yeah. action like even within the action scenes they're comedic like at the end of that movie the second Kingsman I, I, I guess I can spoil it I think it's been long enough now but they literally grind Channing Tatum into meat oh, I think it's Channing Tatum they, they gr- no 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 it's, it's, it's Pedro Pascal's character they grind him in a meat grinder into perfect burgers they don't eat him I don't think I don't I remember not. but they're like there's this really cool like two on one fight scene with 
uh, whatever the name, what, what's the name of that main actor? Um, Taron uh, Egerton. Yeah. Is that yeah. And they, and um, it's not Clive Owen, but I always think it's Clive Owen. Um, the guy from Mamma Mia. <laughs> yeah. Fucking, it's, it's, it's the other Clive. Uh, the case basically. Speech. Yeah. God. Ugh, I, I know who it is. I could list like 20 of his roles, but they're fighting Peter Pascal and it ends up with him getting pushed into this meat grinder. Um, Colin Firth, by the way. Colin Firth. God. You're so close. Uh, I, no, I'm not, but I knew who it was. Um, now I'm all lost. That's why we're talking about it. But that is more, this no, is more straight action comedy, yeah. but it still borrows the, uh, the over the topness it, from it, it, it a basically action. it has to speak a language that this movie kind of established basically um sure yeah good and, way to put it. and the only way to do that is to mimic and push further but uh but, you know there's there's a bunch of other movies that do it too um that was just the first one that popped into my head uh and the good thing is uh speaking to it obviously that one is more uh like you said it's it's action with the comedy played more directly I mean, John Woo definitely likes to bring the comedy in here. It's just... Oh, yeah, no, no, there, there's comedy in the movie, yeah. but there's... It's not the, the same, and I, yeah. I agree on that. Yeah. Even ha- though I haven't seen it, I agree. Well, um, it's like, uh, like Scott Pilgrim is an action comedy, yeah. you know? But, like, you would never compare that to a John Woo film, which has action and has comedy. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's about the, yeah. the emphasis and the way they do the news. I think The Rock is a good comparison, though. The Rock is not as good of a movie. The action's a lot muddier, but uh-huh. as far as like never backing off their scale, like I'm just picturing the Nicolas Cage scene where he's got the uh, the flares and he gets down on his knees <laughs> and the jets fly over. You know, oh, that yeah. could have been when like Michael Bay could have called John Woo and been like, oh, this movie really needs like one more thing," and even like get this guy. His name's James Caviezel. He'll be big someday. <laughs> yeah, he's gonna fly your plane. Yeah. Uh, but like I don't know, there's there's it's there's like a whole brand. I mean, Michael Bay has become like yeah, for sure. I mean, I, don't know, I mean like whereas in the late '90s, early 2000s, John Woo was like a big name in action. Michael Bay, like in the mid 2000s and on, is like oh, it's almost a subgenre of his own. It's a Michael Bay film. Yeah, yeah, and, and so that yeah, and there's definitely. Yeah. I mean, you could draw some roots to between them too. Um, yeah, but I will say. Uh, I don't know. I think I think I do appreciate the Wu flair a bit more than the uh, the Michael Bay flair overall. Um, yeah, the Michael Bay flair is more about the pyrotechnics, whereas the Wu flair is about the slow motion is like critical to his yeah, stuff. Yeah. And like I feel like it's still very character. Yeah, focused. and and speaking of that, um, another I thought of another good example, uh, Zack Snyder. Um, I will say not as yeah, not as uh, fun. In any similar <laughs> way as a John Woo action scene, but he definitely yeah. has, you know, influences from it for sure. Um, yeah, like uh, in, in a watch, in, in the fight scenes in the Watchmen, I can see, yeah. you know, uh, using the same choreographer or something. Yeah, and it's you know the the the, the speed ramping is like Snyder's big thing, but yeah, like you just yeah. said, to do a Woo movie, you have to have slow mo, and Woo's been doing that a lot longer. So uh, the speed ramping, of course, is going back and forth, but. In a movie like Watchmen, I mean, half the half the choreography, they'll zoom in tight on the weapons and the weapon work going on at the same time. And that's directly John Woo play right there. I mean, every time yeah. Castro Troy pulls out his guns from behind him and then the knife from behind him and it's like the close ups of them. I mean, that's that's just it's John Woo, you know, that's For sure. like they could, they could never have with the butterfly knife. Just like taking it out and slowly open it. They always had to do like that flip thing people do. <laughs> yeah. Like they're, they're, that wasn't an option. Like maybe Nicolas Cage did that the first time and Woo was like, cut, cut, cut. No, no, no. You got to do the flips with it. And, yeah. Um, no, that, that's, I think that's a, a good comparison to Zack Snyder. I think that's a good call out. Yeah. Uh, one thing that's funny about that end boat chase, <laughs> it ends when they hit like debris and they get launched from their boat. Uh and if you watch the scene again, you'll notice that the stunt where actors look nothing like John Travolta. I did in notice case. that actually because I they couldn't look. They're just brunettes. Yeah, That's I couldn't tell which one was supposed to be which when they hit and they went flying. I was like. I guess that's John Travolta and that one's, but I don't really know because they all of a sudden no, are they, different they, people. They look nothing alike. Yeah. And also, like, I don't think John Travolta and Nicolas Cage look all that alike, but what part of the the core concept of the film was like, oh, like, Archer, it has to be you. You guys look just alike. You have basically the same color eyes. They don't. They don't. Like, mm-hmm. you have the same build. They don't. At all. 
Like if it was like Brendan Fraser and John Travolta, like okay, yeah, God, they have the sign same me the fuck up. Yeah, <laughs> but they don't look like when I think about Nicolas Cage, I think of him as kind of like an uh, almost skeleton like guy, yeah, like yeah. a very skinny, very um, lithe. And when I think of John Travolta, it's as meaty as possible. Yeah, and I'm I'm trying to think like I know they made a line about uh, Travolta having to lose some of the fluff um, when they were doing the transformation, but then... Uh, uh, yeah, 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 they said they are going to lipo him a bit, but... Yeah, um, but then I'm trying to think, like, I'm, I feel like they either had Nicolas Cage bulk up a little bit, but since they didn't really show him shirtless, I think they just layered him until he looked a little beefier. Um, because while he does usually look more skeletal, like you said, he didn't really come off <laughs> that way necessarily in this film. And so, so that's all I could think is... Uh, he does look skeletal. <laughs> I mean, his face, for sure. You, you can't avoid that. Yeah, but, no, I, It's just funny to hear the sentence. Yeah. <laughs> um, I did... Also, that's another thing I, I forgot, but uh, but I liked a lot, was when they were describing the surgery process, uh, I really enjoyed that they said they were going to, like, we'll laser, scalp, uh, we'll laser scalpel your hairline to match his. And it's like, John Travolta's hair is barely hanging on at this point. You know, it's like... It's a light dust in certain areas, but it's still there... And then, you know, uh, Nicolas Cage has his famous, um, like, horseshoe uh, Widow's Peak thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was just a funny line to, like, call out Cage's, uh, you know, interesting hairline when Travolta's is, like, a, a windy field sure. some days. But you know what else is funny about that, though? Like, when they're, they're doing the surgery and they cut his face off... And that's when they choose to cut his hair. Yeah. It just seemed like a very irresponsible time to do that. Like you can wait until after the surgery yeah. to like, not even just the laser, the hairline part, literally they get out with shears and they're cutting. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. <laughs> and then you got to imagine when Castor Troy had the surgery done on himself afterward, he had to have the hairline moved up and everything. Yeah. He had to get right? plugs and shit. Some of those seem like one ways, you know, but it, the implication is he had everything done in one night. Yeah. Uh, so it must so have did he just have like? Them. Did they just save uh, the, the Archer's fat for, and his, sure. his hat? I mean, his, his <laughs> hair and his fat. Yeah, like they just saved all of it in a freezer. But yeah, they they must have. You know, they did. The, they must have done the voice test thing too. That was my first question. And they don't really touch it, but it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, I thought that one of the points of the movie was going to be because they make a big deal to say like, oh yeah, you have this thing in your throat, like if you had a really bad cough or if you were choked or anything like that, it would stop working. I thought that was going to come up at some point in the movie. It doesn't. No, it doesn't. It, but been, like, it could have been cool to play with that though. You know, like if he when when he's getting in the fight in prison or something, like if the guy's like choking him, he calls out and it's not his, uh, his own voice. And maybe his brother, like they could show him like questioning it or something. And then yeah. the guy stops showing him, then it's normal again. But, um, I thought that there could have been something there, but there wasn't. Yeah. Like even if they were trying to do something really smart, it could have been like, um, like he has to make a phone call and he has to sound like, 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 and cast tries to sound like himself again. So like he purposefully like chokes himself or something so he can sound like, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's a lot of stupid stuff he could have done, but um, that's another thing though. Like when uh, Travolta's trying to prove to Joan Allen that he's really is, himself like they do the blood test thing that works but like he they could have done something with the voice thing like punch me in the throat and i'll sound just like your husband yeah that'd be weird though <laughs> that would have been weird yeah. also i don't like john allen that much i just gotta say it uh, she was fine here but like i don't i think the only thing i know her in is like maybe pleasantville i know her as an actress but i haven't seen her in a ton um yeah. like i like her a lot in room uh but that's about the extent of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, she's going to uh, run. But, like, here, I like I was hoping that we'd get, like, uh, you know, a Marissa Tomei, maybe. You know, I'm thinking, uh, like, yeah. 97, who yeah. could we get? And I, and I think John, John Allen didn't do anything wrong in this movie. I just, like, I was not excited to you see wanted, John Allen. You wanted a hot 90s wife. There, that's what you wanted. Wife, yeah. Well, but in, in fairness, Travolta and Cage are both a little bit older, so uh, you needed a slightly older... Yeah, no, I uh, mean... I actually give him credit for casting to like an appropriate kind of like maturity there uh, for them. You know what? You know what? I'm just realizing this opportunity. It should have been fucking Kelly Preston. Damn, that would have been good. Um, Kelly Preston's good and everything. Let's watch Twins again. Yeah, for real. She was the best part of Battlefield Earth, that tongue. Oh, yeah. Forrest Whitaker agrees. 
You know what's interesting? <laughs> what's that? Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I nice. just had to, had to double check something. Okay, let's play a little game yeah. real quick. Oh, okay, yeah. Who is older, John Travolta or Joan Allen? Um, I'll go Travolta. You would be correct. He oh. is 64 to her 61. Okay. Follow-up question. Yeah. Who is older, Nicolas Cage or Gina Gershon? Uh, Nicolas Cage. You would be incorrect. She is 56 uh. to his 54. Okay. A very good-looking 56, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. She was a very good looking, uh, you know, 35 in this. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. No, I, I like that Joan Allen's in it now that I think about the age thing. Cause if yeah. this movie was made today, it would be like Amber Heard playing his wife. Um, yeah, yeah, and I'm it sure would I'm still playing. be John Travolta. And that's the weird thing. <laughs> yeah. John Travolta is, uh, yeah. I mean, it's like, you see that all the time in sitcoms, right? Like Kevin James yeah. always gets like a younger and younger wife in every sitcom he's in. <laughs> Well, That'd be a cool movie to make where Kevin James is a serial killer who just keeps killing his wives and getting younger ones. <laughs> yeah, let's write that. No, <laughs> I think contractually Kevin James, every movie is in, has to be a, uh, an Adam Sandler film. So mm. that'll be interesting. Maybe, maybe he has a series of younger and younger wives and then his last hit is going to be Adam Sandler, uh, a.k.a. a sequel to I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry. Nice. Here's what it's going to be called. OK, and this is the perfect way to end this episode. I now pronounce you Chuck the Scary. That's a serial killer name. Yeah, I really thought you were going to go with Till Death Do Us Part. No, no, I'm doing it. I'm doing it a little better. <laughs> Gotta do it up. What well, do you know if uh, if Kevin James was Chuck or Larry in that movie? I don't. Mm. I've seen. And you call yourself a podcaster. I've seen one scene out of that movie, and we don't need to describe it. It was the sex scene, right? No, it was it's... when they consummated the marriage in front of the insurance <laughs> agent to prove it was real. That could be real because I've never actually seen the movie. I've so. never seen it either. No, I'm there's more of a man of the cobbler. That's fair. Uh, it's just a, it's a bit. There's a famous scene in, in the film by famous. I mean, like Reddit famous, where Jessica Biel changes clothes, and I think that's popped up in my uh, feed like uh, once a week. So there it is. Not for me even looking for it, although right, I did right, at one point, right. but now it just shows up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, and one more tie to Reddit there is, and it's not even just Reddit, it's just the internet in general, but that gif of uh, Nicolas Cage like trying to hold back a laugh and then breaking out in hysterical laughter <laughs> is from this movie. Yeah. I didn't realize, I assumed it was from an actual interview because in that little two second clip, it's just like a zoom in of his face and he's sitting on a couch. So I assumed it was like an interview for the Wicker Man or something, uh, but it turns out to be a scene from Face Off. <laughs> <laughs> that's so now that's I understand the level. A <laughs> yeah, that's that's when they're joking about it, when he says he does his wife, right? When he does, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that scene is amazing. Um, is that the scene where he the, says like, "Let's get the ultimate revenge on him"? I'm gonna fuck his wife. No, is that that scene? <laughs> he he says all this stuff about Archer. He's like, "The code to his house is this. The code to the house is that." And they're like, "Well, how do you know all this stuff about Archer, man?" And he goes, "Uh, oh, that's right. I'm sleeping <laughs> with his wife." And then they all start laughing. And like they're all cracking up and that's when he starts doing the crazy laugh. But then uh, a minute later, he's like, let's kill him. I'm going to cut off his face. And then uh, uh, that like, was the, or I'm going to take his face off. Yeah. And yeah that's the away. titular line right yeah, there. They, I love when they do a title job. And this time they did it like 40 times in yeah, a row. Yeah. Because he says, I'm going to take his face off. And then uh, the guy who's talking to is like, you're going to take his <laughs> face off. Off. Like they said it four times. And then they're like, no more drugs for him. Yeah. He's going to take someone's face off. Um, I, I have one last thought. It's my last note on the movie. And this is the third time I've said I have my last thought. So this will be my last one. All right. At the end of the movie, uh, they somehow find another surgeon who can do this incredibly experimental procedure. And he does it perfectly on Archer after Caster Troy's died. And so Archer gets his whole face back. He's like, I don't need that scar back anymore. Which is also funny because it's not the same doctor from before. Yeah. <laughs> so, and the doctor yes, is the like, doctor was like, okay. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> then he shows up back at home. His wife and his sister are really happy to see him. And then he's like, oh, and by the way, <laughs> here's our new son. He yeah. like adopts Esther Troy's son. He actually somehow says it more awkward. He's like, I have someone I want you guys to meet. I hope sure. this is okay. Yeah. And 
they're just super accepting and the sister's like let me show you the now normally dressed sister's like let me show you a new room adam but like were they okay with it did he discuss it before that's the thing it's like highly irresponsible yeah either a super irresponsible or it's just mean to adam to make him like think that yeah like get his hopes up (laughs) like i imagine on the car ride over they're like um uh mr archer um you talk to, to to my new mom about this, right? And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's fine. It'll be fine. She's going to love you. <laughs> but imagine if she was just like, we don't have the ability for this new financial burden. It's also weird when you think, uh, and this this could be the final thought here, but uh, <laughs> when you think about it, the last time Adam saw Archer was when his actual father was wearing his face, shooting a machine <laughs> gun at him and yeah. then shot like just everywhere. Th- their entire house they were staying at just shot up by him and his friends and now he's his dad it's weird yeah. how do you explain to me like oh no 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 no, adam that was your real dad yeah wearing I'm your new dad. <laughs> wearing my <laughs> yeah like it just it's weird so very weird one this is my final thought okay okay uh it's it's a stupid thought but i was just reading my notes one more time uh do you know what the bomb said after castro troy armed it oh uh it was very dumb. It had a woman's name, didn't it? Uh, it was a... I wouldn't say a woman's name. It's more of a surname. It said Sinclair, it, Sinclair is hot. That's right, yeah. Because the bomb's hot. Because uh, That's so stupid. Um. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, that's face-off. Uh, yep, that's face-off. Uh, Max, <laughs> where can the good people find us? You can find us swapping faces at our local hospital. Yeah. Or you can find us at the criticalbreakdown.com. We're on Instagram. We're on uh, Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on all the uh, the podcatchers out there that we could find and add our feed to. iTunes, Stitcher, Player FM, anything like that. Uh, look for us. You'll find us. Um. You can find me eating a peach for hours. Or you can find me at Max Rivera Film on Twitter. I'm also on tons of other social networks, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I just said that one already. Letterboxd. Uh, look me up. Uh, I was going to say the same thing. Um, eating a peach for hours. So you can find me um, kicking criminals in the face with magnetic metal shoes. Mm-hmm. Or you can find me on Instagram or on Twitter at Breakdown underscore Scott. You can also find me on Letterboxd at Stenning2. I log every new movie I watch. So, uh, and, I, and I write a little review for it there. So check it out if you're interested in my thoughts. Nice. Um, next, uh, our music is done by Jason Brown. Our artwork is done by Josh Rivera. And Wally is the podcast... Uh, dog. Yeah, he is. The podcast Dove. <laughs> and we're the podcast Troys. <laughs> Next week on The Critical Breakdown. Scott, what are we watching? The Spectacular Now. When are we watching it? Spectacular Now. <laughs> Rated 92% on Rotten Tomatoes.